Good morning, it's Reverend Mike Capron from the First Presbyterian Church of Troy, Pennsylvania. Um, got a sermon this morning on uh, really all of Proverbs chapter 1. That would be a long reading, so uh, you'll have to make do with the quotes that I give you in the sermon. Although I would commend Proverbs 1 for you to uh, read on your own. You know, I haven't heard too many sermons based on Proverbs. Uh, I suspect that part of the issue might be that the definition of the word proverb has changed a bit. It used to imply something of wisdom and substance, but today it may have a nuance, something more like a quaint saying. Um, one of the things I loved about living in the South was the colorful sayings and images some people used. I about fell off my chair laughing one day when someone was telling a very serious story and suddenly exclaimed, well, I was more nervous than a long-tailed cat in a room full of rocking chairs. <laughs> A memorable quote, makes sense, conveys a meaning well. Might be considered a proverb today, but maybe not in the biblical or traditional sense. The older meanings of the word would not have included quaint. Indeed, the uh, book of Proverbs is deadly serious. For openers, Proverbs 1-2 says, For learning about wisdom and instruction, for understanding words of insight. So the book of Proverbs is about education, but it is not a value-free form of education. You can forget about separation of church and state when you attend a Proverbs class. This is godly wisdom. Uh, there is a clear sense of right and wrong in Proverbs. People are either wise or foolish. They either seek uh, knowledge or they choose to remain ignorant. Verse 7 lays out the difference between the wise and the fools in a very clear way. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. This phrase, the fear of the Lord, always calls for a little explaining. It certainly doesn't mean terror or fear in the sense of someone uh, being out to get you, but it does mean that you need to take the Lord into account. Suppose I'm driving a car and pull into an intersection at a four-way stop sign at the same time another car does. I had better have a little fear of that car in the sense that I'd better not ignore it or pretend it isn't there. Or if I'm a child in a healthy family where parents punish children's misbehavior in appropriate ways, I ought to have a certain kind of fear of my parents. Uh, I'm not talking here about unhealthy and abusive families where children may have actual terror of their parents, but the kind of family where there are known rules and reasonable punishments for breaking them. You get the idea. I may fear my coach, drill sergeant, music teacher, editor, or manager, but if they are any good at all, that fear comes out of a knowledge that what they want is, is best for me and that the only time I get in trouble is when I do something, well, foolish. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Conversely, most of us have, have been in a situation where we knew more about some job than our child or a new employee or a novice. We try to help them out and find that some are receptive and some kind of blow us off. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. God is in precisely the same position as that parent or coach or manager. God knows the best way for us to live and tells us what it is. And when it is ignored, God seems to feel the same frustration that we do. One might sum up uh, this whole thing with the complaint, fools never listen. But God does not meekly post some suggestions on some obscure internet forum. Rather, God shouts out loud what must be done and not done. Uh, this is shown in the interesting way that God's wisdom is personified as a woman uh, during several sections of Proverbs, including chapter 1. Wisdom cries out in the street. In the square, she raises her voice. At the busiest corner, she cries out. At the entrance of the city gates, she speaks. How long, O naive ones, will you love being simple? How long will scoffers delight in their scoffing? And fools hate knowledge. Wisdom constantly invites those who are fooled or unlearned to come to her and gain wisdom and knowledge. But before anyone gets lost in all this talk about wisdom, 
let us speak for a moment about the content of wisdom's call. You can turn to any of the 31 chapters of Proverbs and find examples in abundance. There was one uh, in chapter 1, verses 8 through 19. These verses deal with the, forgive the pun, proverbial pull of peer pressure on youth. In this case, it comes in the form of an appeal to violence and greed. Come, let us lie in wait for blood. Let us wantonly ambush the innocent. We shall find all kinds of costly things. We shall fill our houses with booty. In other words, come help us mug people, steal from them, and we'll get rich. But wisdom speaks her words of caution. Those people, they lie in wait to kill themselves and set an ambush for their own lives. Such is the end of all who are greedy for gain. It takes away the life of its possessors. This invitation to violence was as familiar to Israel in 1000 BC as in the streets of any city today. And not only is the invitation the same today, the results are as well. Those who live by the sword, gun, knife, or tire iron die by the sword, gun, knife, or tire iron. And wisdom's words pour forth the frustration of God over the senseless violence and wasted lives. Because I have called and you have refused, have stretched out my hand and no one heeded. And because you have ignored all my counsel and would have none of my reproof, I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when panic strikes you. Now, this does not mean that God stops loving us. We have many proofs in the Bible that that never happens. But we also have many proofs that God seethes with frustration and even anger at us when we are foolish and do wrong. Because they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord, would have none of my counsel and despised all my reproof. Therefore, they will eat the fruit of their ways and be filled with the fruit of their schemes. Proverbs reminds us that we suffer the consequences of our actions. For example, someone who goes to great pain and effort to climb to the top of a high cliff and throw themselves off may suddenly choose to cry out to God on the way down. But I suspect they will find that the loving God does not choose to interfere with the workings of gravity on their behalf. Instead, the wise person avoids deadly precipices and certainly doesn't throw themselves off. Wise people listen to wisdom's words. Do not climb the heights of sexual immorality, lying, laziness, violence, addiction, careless words, greed, and the other things that the book of Proverbs warns against. In particular, they take great care with their tongue to control their words. This is warned about in many parts of the Bible. Wise people value the reputation, character, self-discipline, safety, prosperity, and learning that the fear of the Lord brings. And wisdom constantly sings, screeches, and cajoles at us to follow her ways. Her voice is heard in all of creation. Proverbs 8.1, she says, The Lord created me at the beginning of his work, the first of his acts of long ago. And much later, Paul speaks of wisdom and foolishness. Romans chapter 1 says, Ever since the creation of the world, God's eternal power and divine nature, invisible though they are, have been understood and seen through the things that he has made. And so they are without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. But they became futile in their thinking, and their senseless minds were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. All of creation sings wisdom's song. Every moment of our lives, we hear the music of creation. If we are wise, we sing along with wisdom's words and creation's tune. If we are foolish, we ignore the music and make up our own tune and words. I invite you to be wise, to meditate on the music of God's creation and to study the lyrics which may be found in God's word in Proverbs 
and in the whole Bible. Four, waywardness kills the simple, and the complacency of fools destroys them. But those who listen to wisdom will be secure and live at ease without dread of disaster. That's my sermon as it stood yesterday. Sadly, the news this morning brought word of another mass shooting. Four people were killed and about a dozen wounded in Birmingham, Alabama. I was a commissioner to our Presbyterian General Assembly in 2006 in Birmingham, and I think I was in that neighborhood, which was a lovely section of the city with a lot of music happening. So I am saddened to hear this news right on the heels of a similar incident in July for which no arrests have been made. Information on exactly what happened and on motivation is lacking. But in the language of Proverbs, the whole thing seems just foolish. These may have been disputes between individuals which led to the use of guns in an area with many bystanders. This is a violent kind of idiocy, which would have been unimaginable to the biblical writers, where interpersonal violence usually meant fists and knives. In a world where every human being is a miraculous and beloved child of God, the casual endangerment of bystanders is horrific. People who do this also endanger themselves, for God's word states, they shall eat the fruit of their way and be sated with their own devices, for waywardness kills the simple, and the complacency of fools destroys them. When speaking in these sermons, I always endeavor to be factual and truthful. Truthful. So, I mean, I do need to say that uh, all forms of crime have dropped by at least half since 1993, which is remarkably good news, well worth celebrating. Now, there was a spike in violent crime in 2019 and 2020, but violent crime overall resumed its decline since then, all of which will be a little comfort to bereaved families in Birmingham this morning. I have a perception, maybe you agree with me, I'd be curious to hear, that our societal sense of restraint is eroding. There is some common sense, wisdom-based voice that ought to whisper in our ears when one is about to open fire in a crowded area. This is foolish. Stop. The other areas uh, that seem to be getting worse are political-based violence. There have been two assassination attempts against one of our presidential candidates. Unacceptable. But it is the threats against ordinary people who do not have Secret Service protection that disturb me more. We live in a time when librarians sometimes get death threats concerning disputes about books in a library. That's just crazy or to use the biblical word, foolish. Speaking of crazy, there is the sudden attention focused on Springfield, Ohio, despite local politicians and community leaders saying there is nothing to the rumors about their town. And this unwanted attention has even brought bomb threats to the area. It's foolishness. In our church, we've been praying for poll workers and the people who administer elections around the country. These used to be jobs that didn't garner a lot of public attention, but not anymore. People of all political parties should state openly and often that there is no place for violence as we work out our political disputes. And Christians should be first in line to make such declarations. A wise society establishes structures and rules which are fair and thought out well in advance and wise citizens abide by the decisions of these institutions. As wisdom announces, that those who listen to me will be secure and will live at ease without dread of disaster. May it be so among us. May we have a, a peaceful nation that values justice and fairness. And may we embrace these godly, wise values. In Jesus' name, amen.